Hey everybody, welcome back to this series on preparing Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. Today I'm going to be going through a couple things. I'm going to be doing a little bit of cleanup, basically. Going through my notes here and getting rid of stuff that isn't true anymore. Uh, streamlining what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and then preparing a couple things that I hadn't yet prepared, which I realized will be necessary to prepare because I'm assuming something. I'm assuming a couple things the players are going to do, and they might not. So, um, first thing I need to do is I need to go through my document here and just clean up what is true and what isn't true. I have a document that I know is true, and that's the history of Strahd von Zarevich. I have that, and everything in here is true. So I'm going to go through and make sure that what I have matches that. So I have the Legacy of Strahd, which is the campaign that I'm calling it. Uh, Legacy of Strahd takes place some centuries after the great vampire lord returned from his slumber and attempted to reclaim his dominion. So that's just not true. Um, after the vampire lord was slain... Um, yeah. He was thwarted by several graders, including the great ancestor of Ulysses. His body was destroyed, but his spirit lingers just beyond the veil of reality. So, so far, that's true. Uh, a cult led by the dark necromancer Rahadin seeks to return the Dark One to unlife and grant him dominion over the world. To that end, in the land of Barovia, they have spread their dark influence and gathered many forces to their cause. Through foul rituals, they have recreated the horrific werewolves of the ancient past. Yeah, I think that's fair. Have corrupted the son of the Count of Velaki. The, 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 yep, that's right. And other nobles in that city and brought about the madness of the abbot of St. Markovia, a bash of light, hope, and Barovia. So that's all true. They've already returned the Brides of Strahd. They have already begun creating the Brides of Strahd. Dark beings of evil who now prey on the common folk of the land have already left the trail dead and hideous spawn in their wake. They travel on moonless nights but are growing bolder already. Yeah, fair enough. The cult has further made pacts with the druids of the wood who worship on Yester Hill, where a foul tree has grown from the stake used to slay Strahd's mortal form last time. These druids serve Baba Lasaga, who served as Strahd's nurse and mentor, and who served to corrupt his form the last time he appeared. So that's, none of that's true. Serve Baba Lasaga. A foul hag... So she's sort of like that. And then I have this. Trapped in the roots of the tree beneath the earth is the sun sword, an artifact of immense power that the heroes used to weaken Strahd last time. I think I might keep that. Right? That the sun sword is held underground by the roots of the Golthius tree. Um, although it's not going to be called Golthius. Uh, that tree that is under there. And I don't think I'm going to do the blights either. I think this tree is going to be more uh, other things. Druids and hags, essentially. Finally, the cult seeks to gather and slay the descendants of those heroes who defeated Strahd last time as an offering to him upon his return. As well as um, seeks to gather and slay the descendants of those heroes as well as finding a suitable vessel for Strahd's spirit. So they're going to be searching for someone who can basically house Strahd's spirit. Um, I think Ismark is one. Um, Brom Mardikov. Uh, Erwin Mardikov would work. Um, and then, of course, uh, um, Ulysses and Arthur would also serve. Uh, descendants from uh, Eliana. Okay, so finally, the cult. Um, no, this is not true. Oh, maybe they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Irina and Ismark are actually distant cousins of Ulysses and Arthur. They're distantly related. They don't know that. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me. All right, cool. So what that means then is that uh, essentially I have options. If the players leave Ismark behind, then he's going to be taken and he'll he'll become... Strahd. That's how the cult will 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 they'll, they'll put his spirit into this Mark's body, and so it'll be kind of a, a shocking thing for the players to have to deal with when they finally see it's like you recognize him as Ismark, but he has these drawn features and he looks different and his eyes are so it's gonna be Ismark, but Strahd's spirit within him um, rather than Strahd's form, and 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 maybe they'll just like maybe it'll be like a, his form takes the new shape of of Strahd rather than.
than simply just imprinting his spirit in it. Um, yeah. Brahm and Brea Mardikov, the twin children of Erwin and Danica, the ravens who watch. And Vladimir Horngard, the final captain of the Order of the Silver Dragon, who was turned into a foul undead a century ago and now lies trapped in the crypts beneath the ruined Arden Bull Soul. But yeah, I think that's all good. The Tome of Strahd is an essential part of the riddle of the cult seeking it out in order to not simply bring Backstrap and unlock his whole power potential with the book they could unleash darkness and life for an age. However, the one who holds it is cursed. The power of Strahd will focus on the makes them a danger to themselves and those around them. Yeah, so I think I'm going to start making this a more of a thing. One of the high-ranking members of the cult, Reynald Aryan, has ambitions to replace Rahad and become the right hand of Strahd upon his return. That's also interesting because Reynald uh, is a character from Pavel's backstory. I asked him to come up with the man who recruited him into the cult, and he came up with this guy named Reynald. And so Reynald is, um, he's not a Barovian, he's an outsider, but he wants to, uh, so there's some division within the cult. And I think Rahadin is in the castle, but Reynald is going to be like the front man in Balaki, so they'll run into him there. Um, so this is also not true anymore. The Count is going mad for the machinations of his wicked son. And the walkers are rising influence as the townsfolk fall into mistrust and suspicion. The relics from the church are going to go missing. And the Order of the Silver Scale is ramping up its efforts. So this is something that I developed a while back. Uh, or I didn't develop it. I, I took it from Sly Flourish, right? This idea that there is um, a, an order of vigilantes in Velaki who is hunting for, um, or is trying to resist what's going on and what's starting to go on. And they call themselves the Order of the Silver Scale. Um, and they trace their lineage back to the last few knights and squires of Argon Vostolt before it fell. And so they kind of see themselves as like, you know, paladins but they're not they're just common people um and so they're going to try to and they're just another factor involved in all this um the Mardikovs are worried about what will happen to their children so they're, they're keeping an eye and in Krasik, the lord has been turned into a beast and has begun hunting on moonlit nights and his son was killed and now the townsfolk huddle in horror as the number of werewolves grow so i'm i'm shifting the werewolf stuff over to Krasik. so Krasik is going to be more where we have uh witches werewolves and of course the abbot and the abbot is basically dr frankenstein i'm keeping that so um i'm going to be keeping all those things kind of together so if they go over to kresik that's what's going on Velaki is going to be more like cult vampire demon stuff and then barovia is basically just this dead and deserted so they kind of have these two different places to go Velaki and kresik where there's going to be dangers uh, of different sorts and they're all within the gothic horror genre right <laughs> but uh, the focus is going to be different. Paranoia and suspicion and, um, you know, subterfuge in Velaki, where they have to try to find the... And then more like out-and-out out battling and uh, rallying and burning <laughs> in in Kresik. So Kresik and the Abbey go hand-in-hand, hand, werewolves and the monster. That seems to make sense to me. Um, the Martikovs and the Druids, which defines Baba Hill. I, I don't think I'm actually going to do that. I don't think I believe that. Krasik, the Abigail, and Werewolves, which is Vistani and the monster. So I think that's all going on over there. Uh, the Lockheed and the Cult itself, led by Fiona and Reynald. Yeah. Okay, so then I have all this stuff, but I don't. Barovia is introduction, so I have, again, the ideas here. Um, Irina is captured and taken to the castle. She can be by careful party. Not true. The Vistani are divided. Some serve Rahadin, others follow Madame Diva. Um, many seek to just leave. Many seek to just leave Barovia. Barovians are divided. Some will follow the Walkers. Some serve the Lady of the Wood, and by extension, Rahadin. And others will resist, if possible. Most will act from fear and a desire to be alone. By extension, Strahd, I should say. The Abbot has gone mad. hopes that by creating a perfect bride for the returning Strahd, he and his people will be granted immunity from the reign of terror that will follow. So essentially, that's what's that's what's been going on. He's been, um, maybe Baba the Saga has been giving him these horrible dreams. And he's realized, he thinks that they're visions of what will happen. And so he's hoping that if he does this, if he creates this perfect bride, then this may be perfect vessel. Maybe that's what he's trying to do, is create a vessel. Perfect vessel for the returning Strahd. Yeah, that's more it. Uh, he and his people are granted immunity from the reign of terror that will fall. So that's what he's trying to do up there. Um, the Lord of Kresik has given into his bestial side, and the Vistani camp there served him. Some have turned on him. The monster hunter Van Richten stays there seeking the werewolf with his life. That's where Van Richten will come, and he's in Kresik. He's not in Velaki. The Druids are dealing with the Mardikovs. Not sure how to deal with that one. Yeah, it's, yeah I'm, I'm not sure they're either. I'm going to myself with raised by stages. Mm, let's write that one. The Brides of Strahd hunt Velaki and Barovia. Yes. Um, 
Yes, so that's this is also true. The only way to stop Strahd once he has returned, if he returns, is by traveling to the Amber Temple and destroying it first. This involves using the Stone of Tome of Strahd. With the first destroyed Strahd, we'll be able to kill once and for all. That's true. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this end game because I, this was just for me. Why don't the heroes go straight to the castle? Well, they're already not going to do that. Um, so I don't need this. All right, potential allies. Yeah. Potential allies. Esmeralda, Van Richten, Ismark, and Irina, Erwin Mardikov, the Mad Major Mount Baratok. I don't know if I'm going to keep him. I'm going to get rid of him. He's not in this campaign. doesn't really fit. The Revenant, the Order of the Silver Scale, Jenny Greenteeth, and Brother Yulish. Yulish. Brother Yulish is one of the um, uh, monks at the Abbey of St. Markovia. I haven't developed him at all. I just know that he's there. Jenny Greenteeth is a hag's daughter who lives in Valachia, just outside Valachia, and so she's going to be helpful against the hags. She's good. She has separated herself from them, but she's still creepy and knows all that stuff, so Jenny will know more about that if they need to go to her. Order of the Silver Scale, the Vigilantes, the Revenant, um, who is underneath Artagosolf, Erwin Martikov, and then Esmeralda, Van Richten, Ismark, and Irina. All potential allies. Um, yeah, so that's going to go... Um, yes, yeah, so they need the Sun Sword and the Icon of Ravenloft. Um, I, I, I don't know what the Icon of Ravenloft is. Um, they'll learn all these other from the Tome itself, Madame Eva, or perhaps through communication with Rovinus. So, yeah, that's all good. Okay, okay so this is another thing I needed to do is character motivations, locations, and difficulties. Um, and I have a whole bunch there. And then I have the Begins tab, which is just the first session. So here's what I had here. Van Richten's son was turned into a werewolf and he had to kill him. In vengeance, he set out to find the source of the curse. Jason Philistani had been turned by the Lord of Kreswick. He now knows it's him, but has no way at the moment to defeat him. So that's um, Van Richten. So if they go to uh, if they go to um, Kreswick, they'll have that going on there. So this guy and his motivations too. This is the one. Esmeralda is trapped in the vaults below Argan Vosel where one of the brides, her cousin Miri, torments her and he plans to offer her to Strahd as another bride upon his return. The Vistani know of her imprisonment for some help and others of fear to oppose. This one I'm not sure about. Um, I might change this totally because I like the idea of Esmeralda either coming to their rescue at the last moment, so she might be following them at some point. So I can keep her in my back pocket to like, you know, if something starts to go really badly, maybe they get cornered by Lubash or something. Suddenly Esmeralda shows up and drives them off. And, uh, you know, that happens. Irina is caught up in protecting the town, but is desperate to say, uh, oh yeah, I flipped that. <laughs> Got protecting his town. Irina, <laughs> yeah, that's the name there. Uh, Erwin Martikov is trapped both by the cult in Velaki and by the growing threat to his family, whom he had, whom he has sent to the family, uh, distillery. Um, cidery, is that a word? Yeah, cidery, in the countryside. His plan is to thwart the cult, but he has no ally save the Order of the Silver Scale. He does not trust the zeal of his half-ignorant but brave soul. So Erwin Martikov is um, being sort of hemmed in. Uh, they know who he is, but he is uh, tricky enough, and he has enough wiles to keep himself alive. He sent his family away. Um, yeah, okay, so that's that's happening there. Revenant's a soldier who once fought Strahd but was slain before the final battle. No, no. Um... Who once fought Strahd and was successful, but vowed to keep watch uh, against his return. The spirit used to leave as long as Strahd's spirit was present in Barovia. So he wanders the land, slaying other undead. He is currently bound by Babylon's saga and forced to fight the dead of Beres over and over. I actually like this better. The Revenant is a soldier. So Beres was basically where he fell, and now he's trapped by Babylon's saga as this sort of like unending battle. So this is why I wanted to change it. So the Esmeralda's trapped beneath Argon Vostold. He isn't in Argon Vostold, but that would make less sense. Oh, well. Um, uh, I'm going to delete this. Um, who is turned into a revenant by the power of his own vow. I'm going to delete that. Okay. So this is all true then. Um, yes, I like this idea that he's there. The Lord of the Silver Scale are local vigilantes led by one who holds the Silver Sword of Vladimir Horngard. So somehow she got it. She searched the ruin, found the sword, and had a profound spiritual experience dedicated to herself to fighting evil. She organized the folk of Velaki, those she could trust, who was rather ignorant of how to truly fight evil. She needs help uprooting the city, a uh, cult from the city, and the growing number of dreadful blood straining murders. So that's all starting to happen. Um, she's going to be kind of a fanatic. But I don't know what else. She's obviously good in one sense. 
Uh, then we have Jenny Greenteeth is a hag's daughter, a human offered to Pablo Saga by the woods folk of Barovia. She broke free from of her control by making a dark deal and now lives on the outskirts of Alaki, acting as a wise woman, healer, and alchemist. She's only able to act to help a card directly if her heart can be recovered from Pablo Saga. So that's another person. So Jenny is has given up her heart. She's let, left her heart essentially to Pablo Saga. She's free to go, but she can't act against her directly. And so she is going to... Um, be a sort of passive help to the party at first. She can give them enchantments or poultices or potions or things like that, um, advice. But then if they can take out Baba Lasaga, then she can help them directly. Brother Julij sees his abbot's growing madness and seeks to counter it. He's a faithful, but it's simple, but it's dedicated to light, heart, and soul. He needs to save his abbey and by extension, the people of Kresik, and he will, then he will come from the party wherever they lead. So these are, again, potential characters that are all throughout the world. Um, it begins as the coach travels from Savasso. Yeah. Okay, so that is, um, that was the first session. Great. So now this is more accurate. So <laughs> why do this? Well, I want to have the background of what's going on in my head. Like, I don't want, I don't think it's a good idea to plan the story in terms of what's going to happen. But I think you do need to have a sense of the characters, where they are, what they want, and what's going on, broadly speaking, absent the party. And so I like to write these documents out where basically you just go through and you just write out a bunch of stuff <laughs> that you know is, is true. It doesn't necessarily order it well, but this is, I, I find it very helpful just to simply get my thoughts onto paper. I don't reference this usually at the table, but it informs me, especially I'll read through it a couple times um, as I'm preparing it. And it just informs me at the table. Now I'm not bound to it, right? As you can see, I'm changing things as I go. I'm deleting stuff. I'm, I'm moving things around, but what this lets me do, essentially, is it gives me a, a, a framework that I can then use to respond at the table to my players. So if I say something at the table, I can, in, you know, it'll be informed by what I've written here and what I've, you know, reviewed through here. But if I say something different, if, at the, if it's in the moment something seems like a better path to go, I'll, I'll do that at the table. I won't bind myself to this background um, that I've written. And so I'll change it at the table and then go back to my notes and edit them out and change them to fit what I said at the table, which is why it's important to take notes at the table whenever you say something new or whenever you do something you didn't plan to do or a character does or you, you change something pretty dramatic in the story. Like, that's important to take notes of that sort. And I do that sort of thing at the table. I usually will write down just, you know, in, in brief, in my notepad, um, something that I've changed. Okay, I do need to work more on Velaki at some point, but not right now. All right, so that's, that's the legacy of Strahd. That's actually the background of what's going on here. The other thing that I wanted to do is um, develop this, uh, um, this uh, Luvash cabin a little bit more. So what I realized is this. As, as I was thinking about this uh, over my last video where I developed kind of these random encounters for them to run into. One of them was this fallen tree. And I said, you know, if they investigate it, it, it falls near the party. It collapses onto the party, right? And uh, they have to make dex checks or take some damage. It's just like a little trap encounter or like a surprise moment, something to break the tension and to, you know, make them uh, or break the, the monotony or break the travel, right? And add something else going on. And um, if they investigate, they're like, why did this tree just fall on us? then if they roll high enough, they can find that it looks like some creature has weakened the tree. And probably not intentionally this particular tree, but it happened to. And then there are other, you know, tracks and traces in the forest of this large clawed creature moving through. And so if they want, they can track that and then they'll have to roll a hard track check or wisdom check, basically. But um, Varya is a scout, so she has advantage on those sorts of things. So she'll be able to track it probably, although, you know, if she doesn't, that's okay. But it's like a DC 15, so it's hard. And if she succeeds, then, the, or if the party succeeds, then they can track this trail back to this cabin on the south side of the Zare Pool, which is this. I know, so there's a couple problems with the way that this map works. One is that the Zare Pool technically should be at the bottom of the Zare Pool vault. <laughs> but um, I am making it over here, and I'm calling this the Zare Pool with this sort of, well, this is sort of swampy, I guess. Maybe it's a lake. I'm not sure. I think it's supposed to be like a swampy area. Because this is not yeah, over here. You can look at this. This these are like islands, I guess, um, or divisions in the water. Could be swampy land. That's obviously marsh over here. But I, I'm picturing it as sort of a swampy island, basically a large swampy island in the middle. Um, 
great. So um, I have this idea of um, putting Lubash's camp, his little hideout here on the south side of the lake and the Zerpool camp, or sorry, vice versa, rather. The Zerpool camp is on the south side here. It's marked on an X. Whereas um, he is like on this side, on the north side, in, the, in this sort of isolated cabin in the Forest of Shadows. And this is his hideout. It's where he it's where he comes across to spy on the Barovians in Barovian and to harass them and stuff. It's where he uh, goes to watch um, the Vistani when he needs to. It gives him easy access to the castle. It's basically like this, you know, hidden hidden place in the Forest of Shadows. Anyway, an isolated cabin, but it's near the river. So if they if they track it, then you know they might have to track. I guess they have to track across the river, which would be pretty tough. <laughs> um, maybe there's a boat. Maybe there's a little, like, hidden boat up here somewhere. Um, a ferry. A little ferry that crosses the river. Or maybe there's a ford, fordable place in the river that it looks like he went to and they have to pick it up on the far side. Or something like that. Maybe it's maybe it's just simply here. Uh, regardless, uh, um, there is a road that goes west out of Barovia through here, so it, maybe they'll take that one. Um, it kind of has to be on the same side as the road, doesn't it? Yeah, so maybe it's not on the river. Maybe it's just in the woods somewhere, the Vistani woodland. Yeah, so here's the camp, and then his is like out here or something, somewhere down here. Yeah, it would make sense, because that way you can raid both. Anyway, okay. So um, what was the whole point of all that? Well, they can track him down that way. Right? They can find this cabin, and beneath it is this cave. It's a little bit like the, the werewolf quest in The Witcher. Very much like that, actually, if you guys have played that, where there's that house, you can investigate it, and then Witcher 3. And then you go down below it, and there's that cave where the werewolf is. And you have to wait for him to come back, but he's there. So it might be something like that. Like, Luvash is hard to find. You're not going to run into him. Um, but if you, if you know this is his place, then you can camp out there and wait. And so the Vistani know, or at least a couple of them know, where he lives in this cabin. Um, that he has taken it over. It was probably a woodsman's cabin, but he took it over. And then, um, so that's one way of finding it. There's two ways of finding it, essentially. Um, but the problem is, um, I haven't prepared it at all. At all. And if Irenas, and I was, this is what I was saying at the beginning, if they don't go to Mary's, if they don't do that at all, or if they only go to Mary's and that's all they focus on, then Irina could be taken and he'll take her first to this place and then up to Ravenloft. And so um, they might track him down here, which means I need to know the cabin. Um, I don't think we'll get to it in the session, but I, I do want to make sure I kind of know it. So um, we have isolated woodsman's cabin. And this is basically just um, so that I have a sense of what's actually going on here. So I'm going to do a course classic. You got to do book and two things. Um, all right, and we should do that again here. I like the look. <laughs> okay. So um, the approach to the cabin is overgrown, but there is a definite path through the woods from the Zare. Camp. Hard to find. Hard, and that's technical. Hard to find, even if I'll add DC in there just so that I know what I'm talking about. Even if party knows about it. So even if they're told, hey, there's a path they have to follow, it's hard to find. If they don't know to look for it, then they're not going to find it. Um. Along the way, there are signs of a large clawed animal periodically passing through. Okay, so that's going to tell them, uh-oh, we're getting close to this thing, this beast. Um, then, um, the cabin itself is quiet and um, empty most of the time. Uh, 
spiders and uh, rot have set in. <laughs> so it's a nasty place. Um, molded boards, mildew. And um, books. Would a cabin have a? Yeah, he'd have some books. Molded boards, mildewed furniture, and books that are waterlogged and useless. Make up the interior with a. Uh, Disturbing amount of blood stains all around bones and discarded, ripped clothing as well. Um, in one corner, a solid iron. So, you know, he likes his kills fresh sometimes. And uh, Lubash is like a psycho, right? He's like a total psycho. So I'm going to leave that there, and I'm not going to say any more about that. Um, and there's no one there, certainly, unless Irina has been captured, in which case she's chained there. But otherwise, um, no, there's no one there. Um, now, what else can they find here? What else can they find? Well, they can find... Um, he doesn't actually stay here, mostly. He stays in the cave below it. Uh, around back is a small um, hidden uh, hole which leads to a cave beneath the uh, cabin. So run back is a small hidden hole. Um, I don't think there's a well. There's that many do. I'm gonna cut that out. Boom. 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 I'm just gonna say boom. There we go. All right, cool. So that's my. Yeah, that's my new place. Um, now, oops, if we look at my document here, you'll see that werewolves are real strong. So um, they have 20 hit points, which isn't all that much, but they're only damaged by silver or magic sources, which the party currently has zero of. Um, if 12 or more damage comes from the same werewolf contract lycanthropy, so that's another huge danger that they can do, and they get Two attacks plus three d6 damage each, which is, again, very strong. AC 12 is not very high. But their stats are all pretty good. Uh, this is a tough dude. So if I just make him a werewolf, he, you know, Lubash is a werewolf, which I'm going to, <laughs> number 69, but is only present... Um, Rarely, one in six each day to return, and then only after dark, leaving before morning. So he really doesn't want anyone to find him here. He, st he stays very rarely. Um, so if they stumble on this place, they're going to have to like wait for him, which hopefully means they'll be prepared for him. If not... This could get real messy. All right, cool.